Financial Phil is with us via telephone. Good morning, Philly. Good morning, guys. How are you all? Wonderful. Marvelous, Phil. The markets have been trading back and forth between slightly negative, slightly positive. Uh, all morning long right now, they are slightly positive. What is uh, the story here? It's all about the banks, I guess, right now, right? Well, yeah, kind of. It's more all about the Federal Reserve and what the Federal Reserve thinks of the financial uh banks in particular that the situation is going on right now with you know we go back to last week with silicon valley bank and and then signature bank and then the quasi bailout of regions bank and of course credit suisse overseas the forced takeover from ubs and what does that mean and ultimately what we're trying to determine what we're trying to figure out is what will the federal reserve do on tuesday and wednesday when they meet there's a growing population that thinks that this could or probably will cause the Federal Reserve to pause their increase in interest rates and that the banking issues right now will do the Federal Reserve's job for it. On the other hand, you know, we go back to two weeks ago before Silicon Valley Bank, before these issues arose, and it was an overwhelming belief that we were going to have a half a percent increase at this meeting and then out comes the news with Silicon Valley Bank, and we've been bouncing around. Is it going to be no increase? Is it going to be a pause? Or is it going to be a quarter of a percent? What that is right now, I'm telling you, it goes from, it goes from hour to hour on what, um, what we think could happen. And at the end of the day, you know, we've been talking about this for a long time. At the end of the day, it's not so much what happens. It's what the Federal, how the Federal Reserve views it and what they do. So that's what we're looking at right now. Tuesday and Wednesday is a very big day and probably the most uncertain meeting that they've had in quite some time as far as we don't know what they're going to do. Bill, uh, yeah, when you were little, there was a, obviously a big banking crisis. We had the SNL crisis of the 80s. We had the giant banking meltdown uh, a dozen years ago or so. And, and now this is an issue once again. Why do these banking issues seem to run in weird cycles and as a collective group when it happens, Phil? Well, right now, most aren't comparing right yet. Anyway, what's going on right now with back in 2008 and 2009, they're not comparing that quite yet. Essentially, what the issue has been is, as, you know, and it's no different than our portfolios. If you look at the bond piece in your for portfolios over the last year, year and a half, and what you've seen is they have un uncharacteristically have fallen more than what we're accustomed to seeing bonds fall, and it's all in relationship to the Federal Reserve increasing rates. And you know, it, it's this, this inverse relationship with the movement of interest rates that existing bonds have, and banks are subject to that as well. So if they hold too many long-term securities and then they're forced to liquidate those in order to meet withdrawals and uh, you know i'm doing air quotes right now but a run on the bank in order to meet those withdrawals they're in some cases they're only getting 70 to 80 cents on the dollar and they just can't meet it so with silicon valley bank which i still think is probably the best case study of our concerns right now in the case of silicon valley bank and i saw this growing up and i didn't realize what what had happened but now I do. But with Silicon Valley Bank, they were concentrated in technology. So whether it was their loans, consumer deposits, their business deposits that are using those banks for payroll and so forth, loans weren't getting paid in some cases because small, smaller technology companies had failed. And then the ones that did make it that just needed to meet payroll because things aren't going as well as they had been before, there was a huge withdrawal for payrolls. And then you think of well, even the individual customers or clients that just had their deposits there that may have just lost their job, well, guess what they're doing? They're reducing their balances as well. They're pulling money out. So those are withdrawals that the bank had to meet. And because of the concentration in one sector, which being technology or smaller technology, and Silicon Valley says it all in its name, that was one of the reasons why they had failed. I'd seen that growing up, and I just didn't realize it with Make One National Bank as you know, coal mines went on strikes, and next thing you know, Mate One National Bank was a museum. And then another bank came along, and I'm pretty certain that was the same issue then where there was uh, issues in the coal industry, and companies and customers alike had pulled all their money out, and they just had a problem meeting those obligations because of the, the liquidity issues with long-term treasuries. And not liquidity where they can't get their money, 
liquidity where you can't get as much money as what you put into it. You know, and that's something we deal with with clients on a regular basis as well, is if you need that money fairly soon, we have to put it or you should put it in something where you know that you can get that par value back uh, almost immediately. And in the case of Silicon Valley, that, that was the issue. Is longer-term treasuries, they, they just didn't get their, their investment value back that they had put into it because of unexpected withdrawals. Yeah. Uh, good morning, Phil. A couple of three questions. Uh, one, how how great is the risk of additional failures within the banking community? Um, I think it's, it's probably pretty significant, and and I don't I don't know that, but by the reaction of the leaders, you know, forcing uh, UBS to kind of take over Credit Suisse and increasing FDIC insurance, what they're trying to do is protect regional banks are saying, hey, look, we don't want everyone to go to a regional or small bank and pull their money out because that's not to say just because Silicon Valley had that issue that every single regional bank has that same sort of issue. And, you know, as time goes on, we hear about region bank where they had to bail out from, you know, other other banks in the United States. I think it was $30 billion. I don't, I don't know the amount, but where they had that bail out where they could meet those withdrawals. But they're trying to solve those fears by saying, hey, we'll increase our FDIC insurance. So if you had those deposits over 250000 there's no need for you to pull your money out of these smaller or regional banks and then push it into the, the four largest. So I think, I mean, I, I, I don't know is it the best answer, but by the actions they're trying to, to calm our fears down, I wouldn't be shocked. And, and in an environment where this has happened a couple of times, you know, we go back to a year ago, if something like this would have happened to, say, Silicon Valley or Signature Bank or one of these regional banks, it may have just been a blip on the radar screen. It wouldn't have incited it so much fear. But now we start to look at, and we have those fears from a, a decade ago, decade plus ago, but we, we do have those fears of our banks failing. So I, I don't, you know, the better answer to your question is I don't know, but I think there is risk out there that some of the more regional sector specific or uh, banks that, that could have the same issue now the the uh, federal government has been given a lot of uh, uh, rhetoric to it uh, about trying to shore up the banks how much influence how much control uh, do, does the federal government or the fed have at this point in time in preventing additional failures well i think they have a, a fair amount of control I mean, even if we go back before where there you know the bell out and, you know, that said, hey, look, we're not going to let these are too big to fail. We can't allow them to fail. And, and they've kind of inserted some of that easing right now with jawboning. We say that word a lot lately, but with jawboning to suggest that they would increase the FDIC insurance to solve our fears or to calm our fears some with these smaller and regional banks. So I think they have a lot of control over it. One more question. It may not be control that we agree with, but, yeah. but it, it is control. One more question before I turn it over to, uh, to Bill. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about this is in part due to the relaxing of regulations back in the in 2018 and the like. Uh, what is your sense of that? Are the, does the regulations or the relaxing regulations have any impact at all on the uh, on any causative force for the, uh, the bank failures? I, and I, I don't really have a whole lot of insight other than to say that I did reach out to someone that I knew was on the board. Uh, and they're probably listening right now, that they were on the board of a regional bank. And my question to them was, and, and, it, and it, it turned out after he answered, I was like, well, that was kind of a dumb question. But my question was, does regulations look at the type of client customer that you have? Would a regulation say, man, you guys have too many, too much exposure to coal or to technology or to farming or to oil? And the, and the answer was, well, no, that's kind of on the board of directors. But when you really think about it, regional banks wouldn't exist in places like southern West Virginia or Texas or in the Midwest for farms or in Silicon Valley for technology. Regional banks wouldn't exist if you had regulations on how much of one type of customer you could have. So whether or not it's, it's an issue of relaxing regulations, I don't know, or probably a combination of because we, they are dealing with now that if we need to, especially with the tightening of the economy, interest rates have gone up so much in order to solve inflation. They've gone up so much. I think it's 450 basis points or something since they began. But they've gone up so much that now that when banks sell those treasuries, 
in order to satisfy those withdrawals, they're, they're not getting as much money. So looking at the duration of what banks are doing, is, I don't know how, how deep regulators get into that, but looking at the duration, and by duration I mean the time of, you know, before you get your money back, you know, but the bank gets their money back. Are they putting these in two-year securities or 20- or 30-year securities? <laughs> the longer that duration, the more susceptible to the movement of interest rates they are. So, um, Phil, um, question for you. Um, say someone, you know, they recently in, inherited some money um, and they want to, you know, they're concerned. They don't want to necessarily put it in their savings accounts. Um, they're concerned that the bank's going to fail. They don't necessarily want to put it into a, uh, stocks because they're afraid that's going to fail. And, you know, short of uh, taking that money and putting it in your mattress um, to, to keep it nice and safe, um, if they came and sat down and sat down with you, what advice in, at this level of volatile environment that we're having right now, um, not only with, uh, as you mentioned, about portfolios, and I know I'm, I'm, I'm worried every time I look at mine, um, has what directions it gone in, and I know what has been, um, but I don't want to touch it because at that point I do experience the loss. Um, but what advice would you give to people that, you know, hey, I got this money. I want to make it um, work for me for my retirement years. Um, what, what what would you suggest that they would do? It, it, and we would suggest a stubbornly boring uh, response. And it would be the same thing as that we would give it, had given them in 2021, 2020, or 10 years ago. First, you have to look at your own situation and what's the timeline of that money. So what is the purpose? And you had just given me a purpose with retirement. So then we look at, okay, so what age are you going to retire? And let's also not just look at retirement. So many people think that that age of retirement is then that's when my money needs to start. I need to start using it, so it needs to stop working, and that's the wrong answer. You need your money to last for the rest of your life, mm-hmm. not until the day that you retire. The issue with putting it in your, because, hey, I don't want to deal with this volatility. I don't want to deal with the ups and downs of the markets. I can't. What we know, regardless of what's going on, what went on in 2022, we have to keep in mind, even with all this chatter with the banks and such, it's still been a pretty decent year in 2023. We've had an okay year, and we had a pretty good last quarter in 2022. But one thing that we know that the only way to keep up with the pace of inflation is through investments and to deal with some of this uh, the volatility that we have to deal with. And we do know that at the end of the day, the ability for companies to make money is really the all that matters in the equity market. So you have to have some type of equity exposure depending upon what's the timeline of this money. You know, Maybe you just want to buy a car next year. Well, if you want to buy a car next year, that solution is right. Let's just put it in your mattress or let's put it in a cash account and, and know that it's going to be there. But if you're 45, 50, 55 years old and you say, hey, I want to retire in 15, 20 years, well, we got some, t- we got some work to do, and we've got some volatility that we'll probably have to deal with. Now, the extent of that volatility, that, that's going to be a, a based off your own personal situation. Do you have a pension? What's your Social Security look like? What's your health look like? What are your goals? Do you have any family members that you may have to support through your retirement? What's your debts look like? Do you have much debts to pay off? So it, it gets really deep, but at the end of the day, that answer from us anyway, that answer would be the same today as it would have been two, three, four, five, six, seven years ago. It would have been the exact same answer because of the time frame that we're looking at. And I do find that you know, sometimes I am hypocritical because we talk so much about recency. What happened last year? What happened last quarter? What do we expect or think is going to happen tomorrow or today or the next day. In reality, when we sit down and look at someone's financial plan, we don't really care what happens today or or tomorrow or what happened last quarter. We're looking at the entire timeline. Your goals, what what do you want to do in retirement? Do you want to move? Do you have family members to support? So it really, really goes deep into what we would suggest you do with your money. But almost in every case, unless it's something that's coming up recently that you have a purpose for this money, in almost every scenario, equities are going to be a part of it. And sometimes it gives us some heartburn. We also have to measure how much heartburn you can withstand. So I guess you're saying don't uh, don't have a knee jerk reaction <laughs> when you're when you're looking no, towards your exactly when okay. you look to your future. Exactly. Do it strategically and methodically, and uh, don't look for today. But you know things hopefully will 
Did you hear the admiral try to edit you? He wants to ask a question here. I will. <laughs> no, no. I stand away from the knee jerk reaction. I understand that, but from many of us, Phil. Uh, the financial world looks a little bit like whack-a-mole. You hit it in one hit, one one mole or one hole, and something pops up beside it. Uh, the the bank failures has that had any impact at all on the treasures treasure bills? On the treasury bills, yeah. no, not mm-hmm. yet, and and we'll we'll find that out tomorrow, but or Wednesday. Not at the moment, the, the bank failures haven't, because if there's a mathematical equation to look at treasury bills or the risk-free rate of return, as I say in quotation marks. But to, to, to look at that, it, it's all dependent upon the movement of, uh, from the federal government. Now, we've seen yields pop around because of people running in and out of equities and into bonds and, and so forth. So you see yields pop around on a daily basis, which in, in some cases leads to some of the volatility that we that we have have seen and you don't we don't really see headlines about that because it's kind of confusing and it's not easy for someone to read so we'll just pick a headline and go with it and give it place blame or give credit as we say all the time but listen as an example for that i know we're running out of time but as an example for that let's look at the volatility on friday and we'd said early friday morning that that was options friday and it was called quadruple i don't know why quadruple because there were three types of options that but it's not quadruple that's only three but there were it was referred to as quadruple witching options Friday, and which means there was there was two point eight billion dollars I think in open options. I think it was billion, but in open options that we knew had to come to roost on Friday, and that's going to lead to volatility. But you won't find that in headlines. You're not going to find that in a in a major headline because it's very confusing. But that's what happened Friday. There wasn't anything new. I don't think anything new that happened with banks we just focused on banks when the underlying volatility was due to options friday and but our focus was on banks so sometimes what's going on during the day really has nothing to do with what's in the headlines it's just that you you can pick the biggest story of the day and then we'll just say hey this is what caused the markets to do this we've seen it from day to day last week where one day the market would do well and we said well it did well because the Federal Reserve is going to, and it could be true, the Federal Reserve is going to stop increasing rates because of the bank failure and fears, and then the very next day the market drops. We say the market drop because the bank failures. Well, that's the same thing. It didn't make it go up one day and go down the very next day and cause all of that volatility. But we are in, as, as usual, we are in a very uncertain time. And right now the main focus is going to be on the, the pace in which the Federal Reserve battles inflation Everything else that happens, including these bank failures or these bank concerns that we're, that, that we're referring to, it leads into what does it cause the Federal Reserve to do. And right now, that is the main focus, this battle with inflation and how far are they willing to go. Most are starting to think that these bank issues may have done the job for them. Phil, how do we reach you for more information today? You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg. Thank you, Phil. Always a pleasure speaking with you. You guys have a wonderful day. You Thanks, too. Phil. Financial Phil. And you can catch Phil's morning reports each morning at 638, replayed at 738 Monday through Friday. <laughs>